Robert Lee, uh, Chief Executive Officer with Dragos. Thanks for joining us on My Security TV. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we're also with the Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. Our audience is sort of global, uh, predominantly Australia and, and the US. Uh, so most of them will know you, but uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> That's like super pretentious. Like they know you. They, no one knows oh, me. <laughs> well, once you, I think once you read your profile, it'd be surprising if they don't know you. Um, and I think, you know, back from the sort of the National Security Agency days, uh, sort of late, sort of early 2010s, and the like, and I think you got some notoriety when you went to Ukraine and you looked at the Ukraine-Russia attacks in 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. um, maybe let's start there because we're here at the opening of your office in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So welcome to Australia. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And um, Tim Tam Slam, we're good to go. Nice. Well, that's about it. So we're both waiting for a beer, right? Yes, so that's, yes. that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, and that's why I came down from yeah, <laughs> that's specifically. That's the best this. reason, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's start with, with that, the sort of the motivation and the contacts that you had to go to Ukraine, because I think here we are seven years later or thereabouts, mm -hmm. uh, we have an invasion there, so a lot has happened. Yeah. Uh, but from a technology viewpoint, the risk and the threat landscape may have stayed the same. Yeah, so, yeah, a absolutely. So. Yeah, it was, it was quite interesting when it happened, of course, the first ever cyber attack to take down electric power. A lot of theory and, and views that it could happen, but when somebody is bold enough to do it, that's obviously concerning. And the interesting thing about the attack uh, that I kind of always look back at is a lot of the IT security best practices and so forth had nothing to do with what the attack was. Yeah. Our world of operations technology and industrial systems are very, very different. Um, but if you if you look at 2015, a lot of the power engineers and power community looked at that and went, yeah, no kidding. You, of course, somebody can break in and misoperate your system. Um, it was bold. It was sophisticated in its own right, but it wasn't shocking to the electric community that it could happen. It was actually the 2016 Ukraine attacks that scared everybody uh, when the adversary essentially figured out all that they did in 2015, but then moved to codify that into software, software called Crash Override, malware. Uh, and essentially made it where it could automate a lot of what happened in the attack. That really freaked out, uh, rightfully so, a lot of the electric power community on the ability to take down transmission sites and, and do it in a scalable way. How, so when you look at the, if you sort of um, reverse engineer the work that they did, how, how much effort was required and, and the skill sets that they would have needed to, to achieve that automation? Uh, there was a bit of social engineering. They, they infiltrated uh, mm -hmm. their, their target as well. So, you know, in terms of the resources, mm -hmm. nation state only really at this level? At, at that level, for sure. Definitely, definitely state actors. So when you look at the 2015 attack, our analysis was, was probably between 20 or 30 people involved right. uh, just from the timing and commands and things that we saw on the forensic side of it. It would have been about, yeah, 20 or 30 people. When you look at the 2016 attack and sort of automating it, um, they needed all that knowledge, but then you just need to develop the capability once and, and they can kind of scale it out. And so either way, when you hear 20 or 30 people, it doesn't sound all that sophisticated. It doesn't sound like it needs to be a state. But when you talk about the people on keyboard, then you have a whole support structure behind them, HR yeah. and, and, and personnel and handling. And, and, and how much connection out to sort of the, the cyber sort of the black hat community would have been there as well rather than just internal. Yeah. There would have been a high level of secrecy around this yeah, as well. It's, hard. it's always hard to tell how much public research and, and uh, conference presentations is simply going to these attacks, but it's definitely not zero. Um, I think, uh, you know, not, not in any way to diminish the value of good security research, um, but there are times that defenders, I think, overestimate the adversary. Your adversary is somewhere between, generally speaking, somewhere between the ages of 18 and 35, government's their first job, and they've got management and PowerPoint too, yeah, right? They're yeah. still humans. <laughs> And sometimes people come out and be like, oh, look, like here's this cool way to do something that no one ever figured out. Surely the adversaries already know it, but uh, defenders, you better have this. And the adversary is like, I'm going to download that paper. Yep. And, and so in terms of the people actually operating the attack and conducting the attack, state actors. But did they probably benefit from research in the community and so forth? That I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say that they didn't. And the other aspect of that is you were writing along the way as well. How much? Uh, yeah. So how much did you write about 2015? And uh, the other sort of question I had around what might have been on the dark net that they could have been getting what, and where has the dark net changed in this regard, say around this time as well? Yeah, I, I would say like uh, even for myself writing, it was definitely a, hey, industrial attacks are different. It was 
I'm very careful, as I'm sure many people are, never to write things that can be weaponized. Um, but there's obviously a lot of con the things that we're concerned with usually will tip off people, if nothing else, on, oh, they're concerned about that. I wonder why. Yeah. Um, so you, you do have to be really, really careful. You'll see even with our firm, when we find vulnerabilities, we talk about, hey, that's the vulnerability. Here's what you need to know to defend it. And then people will sort of sometimes harass us on, well, why aren't you writing a proof of concept code and showing us how to exploit it? I'm like, I don't want it weaponized. Yeah, like, if, yeah, if yeah. I'm going to give you just enough to defend, but not enough to go weaponize it. Um, but uh, in terms of like Darknet and similar, I think we see a lot these days in terms of people having accounts and, and access. But in terms of the industrial attacks themselves and how to conduct them, not not really anything. Um, the, one of the interesting things about an, an, like an OT cyber attack is you've got to have kind of one part cyber, one part engineering and operations. Yeah. And it's and it's when when an adversary is just doing cybery things, I really don't care if they're just a good engineer, it doesn't really matter, but if they hit the balance between both those things, that's when we get really, really concerned. That's when you get your stuck snets and, and something like that. Yep, like crash like override, traces, yeah. kind of all those various things. When you see that something has been developed by somebody that not only understands the control system, but also understands the operational environment and the engineering to which it would be deployed in, that's those are those state level capabilities that you brief the White House about. And would you generally say that they have to have some sort of physical access as well? Is that you don't have to. You could. Yeah. You definitely could. We haven't seen any uh, cyber attacks on industrial systems that there was an intentional insider. Maybe somebody carried something in, but not yeah. not necessary. Um, there are some scenarios that we think about, especially in like the nuclear power sector. Yeah, um, comes up. But outside of that, it's really just the remote access is there. The environments are connected up way more than people realize, and so it's cyber things but it's then a, an element of engineering workstations and engineering drawings and human machine interface screenshots and you, you can collect all the information digitally yeah, a lot but of that is open source right? yeah but it's putting all that together absolutely yeah. i mean even if you look at like the electric power system in australia there's a lot of open source information that the regulators are forcing the power companies to provide so that it's more equitable yeah. for you know small companies to be able to connect renewables and so forth but a lot of that information is very useful from an adversary perspective as well. And even for, in the environment, all the PLC data sheets are all available. Yeah, and, this is, yeah one of our researchers, Reed Whiteman, I think had like the funniest quote ever. He was like, when you're hacking you know, uh, IT system, you got to fuzz it and research it and throw code and try to exploit it, look for crash dumps and everything. He's like, you want to hack a PLC, just read the manual. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just, there's it's, a lot of native <laughs> functionality there. And they often have uh, sort of the, the high level interface uh, documents out there as well. So yeah, absolutely. What, what they are talking yeah, to. If you, the, the ability to get access to industrial systems and the ability to understand a control system is actually really trivial. Yeah. The ability to do the types of attacks we're worried about is extraordinarily complex. And so that's always kind of the nuance where I'll get in front of people like, oh, it's much harder than you realize. Like, yeah, and we're secure. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. say yeah. you're secure. I just said like, it's really hard. And the um, number of vulnerabilities even that comes across my desk from new PLCs coming onto the market, is it just too hard to achieve 100% well, when I said it's uh, impossible yeah, often, yeah. but is it just too hard for them or are they just too quick to come to the market? Or are yeah, they not doing I, enough I, testing? I, I don't, yeah, I think it's a lot of like the testing and so forth. Yeah. So um, we are we have controllers rolling off, just as you said, the factory floor that have the same vulnerabilities that have been in there for the last 10 years. Yeah. And so where I try to provide the balance is there's a lot of vulnerabilities that are just pointless in industrial security. I mean, we when our Intel team looks through the different vulnerabilities that release each year, we find that only about 4% of them really matter. And so the, the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, like a Siemens, Honeywell, Emerson, whoever, get beat up a lot about vulnerabilities that don't actually impact the operations at all. Um, but then there are some simple things that they should be doing that some of them aren't. And it's kind of like, come on, guys. Like, as a good example, do I want protocols that are encrypted? No actually not like it doesn't actually do anything for security but do i want you to use encryption to digitally sign your firmware yes please yeah. do that and so uh, can, can i have consistent logging across a control system oh my gosh it'd be amazing but do i really care that there's a privilege privilege escalation vulnerability on a plc not really because that's not the point and so they get they get sort of pushed on a lot of angles and i think they're falling down on most of them but there's probably only a couple things that if they just did those couple things, we'd be in a much better place. And is it things like the standards? And uh, I'm testing my knowledge here. I didn't research uh, the IEC 6443. Yeah, 62443. That's some like, here. that's some, it's some, you, yeah, you got some so uh, in-depth knowledge there in the yeah, culture. Yeah, they got to yeah, stick yeah. to that. 
Yeah, so that, that's actually part of the problem. So 6403 is actually a great standard, um, and you shouldn't build your security off a standard. You should build your security and map it to a standard. But um, what we find for the vendors is like sometimes for their RFPs and so forth, a customer will just like staple 62443 to a guy, <laughs> yeah. and they'll be like, Didn't comply with this. Yes. And it's like, what? That's not what that's there for. So for your original equipment manufacturer, it's really hard to do that. And, and instead of, hey, here's the three or four things that are really important to us. Yeah. And so I, I don't think the stand, there's no product security standards that really apply across these different uh, product lines. And the community is not consistent in its guidance back to the original equipment manufacturers. Now, that's not just an out for the OEMs. Like, they still do plenty of things that are frustrating. Um, as an example, it's uh, the SBOM discussion. There is going to be a lot of hype and a lot of just noise with the software bill of materials or SBOM. But there's some really good applications. As an example, do you have a vulnerability that gets reported to Honeywell that is uh, they issue an advisory on in a patch? But the vulnerability is actually in the Codices framework that they're using, which is actually in 200 other PLCs. But because those vendors didn't get notified, they don't put out a patch or vulnerability for the exact same issue. And so that's actually a really good use case of SBOM. That's a really good use case of where we have problems where we might know there's an issue. And we say that one out of the thousand is really good. But we actually have no idea where all that issue is. Yeah. Now, what are your what's your been your observations here in in Australia? Um, you're up in Dubai. Did you open up office in Dubai as well? Yeah, I opened up an office in Dubai. I've got one in the UK, uh, two in the US, and now in Maryland, uh, okay. Melbourne. Yeah. Well, I suppose the story is you were in Ukraine. You investigated. So you came out of the NSA, mm -hmm. uh, and you had a bit of a history there in cybersecurity. There, uh, went to Ukraine. Thought, okay, there's a business requirement here. Mm -hmm. Selfishly, um, wanted my kid to have lights and water when he grows up. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. So the journey here now, you've got offices around the world. That's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty good. I think I read you're what Fortune what, under the thirties or the top thirty Fortune. So yeah, we were. Uh, yeah, we're one of the fastest growing tech companies in the world now, yeah. which is kind of weird. So what's the strategy? Are you doing training? You got some products as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and what are you finding the uptake uh, from? Because we've now got. 11 critical sectors here in Australia. Do you find that has helped the definition yeah. of a critical infrastructure I think or it's you probably, just focus on the IoT? Yeah, I think the critical infrastructure definitions sometimes are confusing to people. Yeah. Um, and some of your smallest sites on an electric power system may not be a critical national infrastructure, but if you look under the hood, you're like, oh, actually, if that goes down, that port goes down and therefore that goes down. And you're like, okay, that's actually critical. Um, so all we focus on is the OT side of the house. Got it. I think the IT networks of power companies are really important to someone else. I couldn't care less about them. <laughs> like I just care about your substations, your, your mines, your ports, and so forth. Um, and uh, as a company, we're a tech company, and so we create software to help people get an understanding of what's in their environment and be able to detect threats and so forth. But we also have our services team that responds to attacks, and we get called in a lot, right. and our intel team that analyzes and kind of puts out these reports. But the other things we do, like the training, is just really be a good partner. So we don't make money on the training classes. It's not a good business line, not scalable. Uh, but if we're going to come and open up an office in Melbourne, I don't want to just say, here, buy my box. Yeah. You know, it's always people processing technology. So I want to be able to transfer knowledge. Yeah, well, you've got a nice training room here, and mm -hmm. I'll, we'll have some photos on the show notes. But who do you normally deal with? This is something I do consulting as well. I know there's a, a consulting firm here uh, that uh, I'm aware of. So I'm just wondering, who do you normally deal with at the client facing? Because are you dealing with the, the process engineers or oh, are you yeah. dealing with new security teams that have been created? Because mm -hmm. in my experience, say with uh, utility services and the like, they're often just bringing people in going, hey, you're now responsible for security because we've got a new critical yeah. infrastructure bill out. Okay. Yeah, so generally speaking, OT security is a board level topic around the world right now. It was yeah. not that way five years ago, but it is made up. I mean, hell, even the World Economic Forum is talking about OT security, which is like yeah. wild and amazing. Um, so it is a board level driver, but it's oftentimes getting passed off to the chief information security officer. And so it's the traditional security side of the house. But even if they decide on a plan, if it's not done in coordination with operations engineering, that plan's not getting executed. They can choose a vendor and go buy a bunch of boxes. It's not getting deployed in that site. Um, so oftentimes, even though we're a tech company, we, we do the services to try to come in and help them bridge that gap. And uh, uh, sometimes you joke around that it's kind of like marriage counseling <laughs> on, yeah. hey, there is reasons to do security, but no, it's not other crap. I so mean, you do, you do yeah. fine. You're still dealing with IT, OT, yeah. 
teams that yes. you need to bring them together. Yeah, for sure. And and, and again, I I mean, hell, I've responded to more power outages from well-intentioned IT people than Russia, China, Iran combined. So it's not right. like the operations side of the house doesn't have a really good point of view of like, you aren't really prepared to come into yeah. this rail site. Please don't do that. Um, but at the same time, the ones that push back go, yeah, we're not a target anyways. And you're like, no, 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 stop, stop. Yes, yes, you are. We, we need to do the security of it, but no, we don't need to do all the IT security controls. Do they, do you find that they struggle with the, um, the, the risk, you know, the, the, you got the CIA for the IT mm -hmm. and then the more on productivity, a, a reliability and availability. Safety, yeah, definitely the, safety and production safety focused. Side, of course, is, is that's. They, they they always talk safety rather than security. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you definitely see that, but I think... It's changing? Do you think it, they're aware it's, now? It's absolutely becoming more aware. And yeah. for the operations side of the house to understand that there's security people that understand the mission of the site and understand the industrial operations and not just IT security controls, they're more welcoming in. You know, there's friction on both sides. I walk into a company... And, and like oftentimes these days, it's surprisingly both the IT and OT side of the house are aligned. And then, then they're just looking for help to go to the next level. Sometimes you'll walk in, they're, they're misaligned, and it's a 50-50 on, nope, the operations side of the house are being jackasses here. Nope, the IT side yeah. of the house is being jackasses here. It's, it's just kind of a flip That's of coin. That's you need a consultant to come in and go. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> yeah, and it's <laughs> also, again, just like knowledge transfer. It's not like FUD and like, oh, you're going to die. We need blockchain. Yeah. And no, 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 stop. Just, <laughs> hey, we should do this work because of our industrial environments yeah. are changing. There's hyper connectivity these days let's let's be thoughtful about this and they do they struggle with the resources as well because they oh, have for sure. big environments well that's actually probably one of the most interesting things in australia and it's very similar to the u.s but probably the messaging is a bit different where um so the australian government's doing a really good job of putting out legislation focused on soki and like trying to trying to say yes there's critical infrastructure sites you need to do something but they're kind of communicating about the threat as like a level 10 which is probably appropriate for all the stuff we're seeing and conflict in ukraine and everything else yeah but then the legislation is pushing for things at like a level two. And, and if you're in an oil company or a port, you can deal with that because you're, you've got the money to do it one way or the other. If you're at a utility, you know, gas, water, electric, you are regulated by your various state institutions about how much you're allowed to spend. So for the utility, they're like, yeah, we believe the threat's a 10, but you just told us to only spend at a two. So you tell us what you want to do. And yeah. so that's the same thing in the U.S. where – Government's like, why aren't you doing more? And then the utilities are just like, go talk to the Public Utilities Commission that regulates how much money we can spend. Yep. And until you get the public uh, sort of aligned with that, it's difficult. I mean, and it's, I'm not trying to put it down at all. Like sometimes power companies have not done the, the right things either. But try to go to your layman person in the community and say, hey, I want you to pay 20 cents more on your electric bill because Russia. That's a, that's just not a conversation yeah. that carries very easily. And they, they have to, you know, the, the amount of number of controls that they can implement as well could be overwhelming. They don't have to do oh, all yeah. of them. And if they do them more strategically, they can get more for bang sure. for their buck. There's right? like, there's, I don't know, 40 or 50 things you can do in IT. There's yeah. like five, maybe six that you probably yeah. should do in OT. But when a company hears from one consultant, then the vendor, then the manufacturer, then the government, then a different government agency and a different government agency and a law enforcement and an international standard and regulation. <laughs> By the end of the day, everybody's saying, just do these two or three things. Yeah, no, and they're right. met like with like 20 different things to do from 20 disparate sources. Yeah. And they're like, what do you want me to do? What, what about from the black hat community? Do you monitor what they're doing and are they changing or adapting? Do they see opportunity here or is it just pure nation state? Yeah, so the main things that we see outside of state actors is the criminal actors on the ransomware side. And I don't think they're really going at the problem going, oh, that's a SCADA system versus a DCS. But what they're seeing is whatever that weird stuff is over there on that side of the house, when we hit it, they pay more and pay faster. Mm. That's interesting. And so they're, they're targeting industrial operations environments a lot more, but I don't think it's really with skill of what industrial control systems are. It's just a feedback loop of I get paid more and I get paid faster if I bring down operations. Yeah. Is it is it coincidence that they were Russian when they first started? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they might still be now. But yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah so they, it's pretty, it's like yeah. Russia in the US where XNSA, yeah, yeah. XNSA come out to the <laughs> yeah, yeah, start yeah. their own company. It's, it's, uh, Russia, you they see. tend to be black hats. Yeah, it depends on your local laws and considerations and similar, right? So if you have a government that does not prosecute you for attacking anybody but your own government, well, then you've got a, an opportunity to go yeah. do stuff. So, you know, not every, not every criminal actor is Russian, you know, but at the same time, yes, there are a lot of Russian criminal actors. And so uh, sometimes you see various Russian-based groups that sometimes maybe take slight tasking and sometimes maybe no tasking at all. But then sometimes you'll see North Korean or Chinese-based groups that 
it's the same people, you know, during the day they're running operations yeah. and at night they're paying for their operations. And then you'll find U S and UK based kids. I mean, you saw, uh, some of the groups in, or one of the groups in the UK, we had, um, two folks that were doing a variety of different compromises. And so it, it kind of happens around the world, but, um, Eastern Europe tends to be an environment where not all Eastern Europe, parts of Eastern Europe to be an environment where there may not be the same economic outcomes. And now I can go invest in security skills, get away with it, never prosecuted, and make millions of dollars. Like, yeah, I'm going to go do that. Yep. Have you monitored the the current situation in Ukraine and how Russia pre-war, even during now, because uh, they didn't quite attack as what, what might have been expected, mm-hmm. and then we've got the shields up warning, you know, from the US and the like, and there hasn't been any major attack that we've seen. Do you think that's just luck or they haven't yeah, had they haven't I, had tool sets or they they haven't pressed the button yet yeah i think so this is an interesting one for sure so I've definitely been following it pretty closely and been involved quite closely um we started seeing groups that we were concerned with especially one of them exenotime you always just make up some random name but exenotime was the group responsible for the cyber attack on the safety system in in uh, saudi arabia in 2017 so they try to kill people through this trisis malware that same group around October started really dialing up their reconnaissance effort, not compromise anybody yet, but reconnaissance effort of picking out key liquid natural gas and electric sites across Australia and, and the U S. And so that was concerning to see the people that had tried to kill people before and had been attributed to the Russian government by the U S government now picking out key sites in the U S and Australia. And so we, we were a little bit concerned about that. Uh, and then since then, uh, what I can say is we are we are aware that there is industrial capability development being done uh, by folks. So not saying anything has been deployed into networks, but we know they're working on some stuff. Uh, and then outside of that, there was actually quite a quite a bit of cyber activity in Ukraine. Um, but when people are getting shot and getting murdered, the the journalism community very rightfully was focusing on bombs and bullets, not cyber attacks. So there's more going on in Ukraine that's getting reported, but we would have expected to see some other things. I totally would have expected to see portions of the electric system go down. And I don't know, I haven't been able to, um, you know, get Putin and ask him, but uh, one of the things that I think is a good hypothesis, not a fact, but just a hypothesis is uh, if we are to take Western intelligence at face value, There was a viewpoint that Putin was so paranoid because of Western intelligence that he really didn't tell anybody they were going to war. You know, there was troops that went over there really expecting it to be a three day special operation. And you don't just like flip on cyber like it's a light switch. You have to do preparatory action and so forth. And so it's not surprising to me that the cyber based teams in Russia weren't prepared to do anything. But around 11 or 12 days into the conflict, you started seeing additional cyber attacks. You saw the satellite based, you know, uh, uh, um, satellite received terminal based attacks. You started seeing the activity that you would expect. Um, But cyber tends to be a really good tool pre-conflict and kind of in the gray areas of conflict. But once there is conflict and bullets flying, it's not the most important thing. You also have an information war there. You mentioned satellites. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do a bit in space. What? What any work you've been doing with satellite security? Yeah, so there's a lot of control systems in space, yeah. and, <laughs> and they're old. Uh, and they're old. Uh, but the, most of the concern tends to be on the sort of the backbone of the communications for it, and on the ground receive stations, ground terminal units, yeah. uh, VSAT, things like that. Uh, and I think that that's pretty classic OT security on those sites. On the satellites themselves, obviously a lot harder. But I don't. Even though there are control systems, it's really not just an OT network. Yeah. So so product security in IT tends to be really important. Product security in OT is really not the most important thing. When you're looking at satellites, reducing the functionality on that satellite through things like product security can actually be really helpful. Okay. Well, look, the noise is getting a little bit louder yeah. outside. They're, they're, so getting, the ready to, they're getting ready to party with the uh, going beer. For a good 20 odd minutes. So I'm really happy with that and your insights. What, uh, what would be your key message for the Australian mm-hmm. sort of OT cybersecurity sector um, and for the industry as well. So I think for the for the utility sector and the OT operators, mm-hmm. uh, and then also from sort of the cybersecurity sector, you know, is there opportunity in, in OT mm-hmm. cybersecurity? Should IT cyber 
people be thinking, oh, I nearly really have to uplift my oh, absolutely. OT skills. Yeah, number one statement is defense is doable. We always sit around and go, oh my God, it's so bad. Attackers are do this, attackers are that. Like, we define the landscape. You can, you can really do this well, and we've seen companies do it well. Number two is, again, there's only a couple controls that you really need to get right. Don't come into OT security with all your IT security biases and throwing standards and frameworks. Yeah. And you're like, why is that on Windows XP? That's not what makes the lights blink. Don't, don't over-focus on things like that. And number three is like the water's warm coming over. Uh, <laughs> if you're if you're coming in humble and hungry and you want to help out, like the operation side of the house welcomes you. If you're coming in again, trying to grill people and chastise them, of course you're not going to be welcome. And I, I talk to governments, you know, ACSC and ASD and the folks here in Home Affairs as well about this, where there's a lot of good people there just trying to do the right thing. Yep. And it's like, hey, go talk to them. Go, go talk to your infrastructure owners and ask what they need because. Your, your power companies, as an example, and there's plenty mining, you know, oil and gas ports, there's a lot of good people here, but your power companies, as an example, they work and live in the communities they serve. They want the lights to stay on as yeah. badly as you do. Don't vilify them. They're busting their ass. But how do we get them the resources to be successful and focus them on the couple things they need to do, not all the things that we just think are good ideas? So you would, and maybe the final question would be, you've been welcomed uh, by sort of government, you've, you've met with ASD, ACSC. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And it's, I've been, you know, look, I've, I've come to Australia many, many times and um, I've always found it to be a good community. One of the reasons we're here is not, I mean, if we were a smart company, I would have gone to Germany before we went to Australia, okay. you know, just from like a market sizing, but there's a good community here and they want to get the mission done. And I want to partner with people like yeah. that, but, um, hell I've had, I've had dinners with everybody from Malcolm Turnbull and, and talking about the previous, nice. you know, approaches to home affairs and ASD and ACSC to power companies and so forth and ports. I mean, you, you just, you've got an amazing community, but we all have to appreciate that we are behind, not because anybody did the wrong thing, but we're behind because the landscape is changing. Yep. Now, for the protection of our people and our national security, we got to go figure it out. Nice. Well, Robert Lee, Chief Executive Officer with Dragos in Massachusetts, normally. Ah, uh, Maryland. 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 It's an M before. and it's America. I that's fine. I don't like, even go to San Francisco. Yes. <laughs> I've been to America. I went to New York one time. Yeah, yeah no, okay. All right. You're all the same. But on, on that note, we'll finish it. Thank you very it, much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'll say the Cybersecurity Weekly Podcast just in case the videos don't work. Yeah, thanks so Good much. Man. Thanks, Robert. Cheers, Appreciate mate. it.